This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Mike Lee in Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chamel. Jeff, welcome to Five Questions. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to answer your five questions. How did the success of your comic strip in college inspire you to pursue a career as a cartoonist? Oh, it gave me that taste of sort of localized fame. I went to the University of Maryland where we had a publication called The Diamondback. And the circulation, I believe at that time, the print circulation was 30,000. So every night I'd work on my comic and then the next day I'd go to the dining hall and I'd see people reading it and maybe having a laugh over it. And that was really addictive to me. I felt like I knew what I wanted to do from then on. And it was probably a signal, hey, I'm probably good at this too and people like it. So maybe I, I should keep doing this because I just feel like as an author and I've written like thousands of articles too, like once you start getting the positive feedback, the reviews, you're like, oh, like what I'm doing maybe matters or people are getting value from it. So maybe I should keep doing it. Yeah. And what was funny about me was that I was never a great illustrator. And I could see that my favorite cartoonists were fine artists like Bill Watterson and Charles Schultz. I wasn't that. I knew I was a pretty good gag writer. And I eventually that became a big problem for me because when I tried to become a syndicated cartoonist, Nobody liked my work, and it was because my drawings didn't look professional enough. So I had to think of another way to get my cartoons out there, and that was to really downscale my cartoons and make them uh, look like they were drawn by a middle schooler because that's sort of where I topped out on the uh, artistic uh, you know, talent side of things. And moving on to book publishing, I mean, I, all, my, all three of my books were rejected by every publisher besides one. Yeah. So it was very, very tough. And I know for you, it, it did take many years to get the first Diary of a Wimpy Kid published. What were the biggest challenges for you? Mm. I think the biggest challenge for me was um, feeling like there was a market for it because I tried to become a syndicated cartoonist. It didn't work at all. I didn't get any positive feedback. I was rejected many, many times over. And so working on Diary of a Wimpy Kid for eight or nine years, the whole time I was thinking, this is also going to get rejected, but I'm going to I'm going to do my best at this. I'm gonna have no regrets about this. So I really, really worked at it. So um, you know, something I found out recently in these lawsuits that have come up with, uh, I think it's Simon Schuster, um, that uh, they, they said 98% of books sell less than 2000 copies, which is yeah. just shocking and discouraging, you know? So if I had known that, maybe I would have given up. Definitely. I remember that stat too. I'm like, oh man, it's like hopeless. Yeah. But I right. also feel, and you probably can relate to this too, like it kind of drove me, like all the rejection. I'm like, I kind of wanted it more and mm. I kind of worked harder for it. I'm like, oh, okay, like, I guess I have to build a bigger platform. I have to like, you know, do another draft or an outline or whatever I had to do for each individual one. So it kind of drove me to work harder because I felt like I had something to prove at the same time. Oh, you didn't want this. It's not just about you. It's about them. It could be about the editor. It could be about a time when it's be being released. There's so many variables that a lot of people who aren't in the industry don't know. Yeah, and I don't do a good job of selling myself. I think that, you know, what I would have done um, is I would have, put out my best work, hope that there was an audience for it. And then I don't think I would have pushed it, you know, and in and, and these days, whether you're an author or an actor or a musician, you really need to work the social media. So you need to be good at two things. You need to be good at your craft and uh, selling yourself. And I don't think I ever would have been good at selling myself. Yeah, my first book was Me 2.0 about personal branding. So that's kind of right. my forte. Yeah. And you, you've you sold hundreds of millions of books at this point, which is kind of remarkable if you really think about the amount of authors, as you were saying, who could even sell 2000, like hundreds of millions is like a phenomenon level. So how did you turn this book series into a brand and now an empire? Well, that's a great question. And, and I, I do think of, about that a lot is that it is a brand like we have a staff of four people and there's there's a rhythm to it. There's an expectation, there's a constancy uh, to this. And that that's very unusual, actually, because most authors, even who, authors who have a big hit, uh, you know, the book goes through maybe three or four in, in a series and then it kind of fizzles out or the author ends the series. And so that has been something I've been working really hard at to kind of create this guarantee. And I think 
part of what's working in my favor is the fact that I am a cartoonist is that a cartoon is a promise. A cartoon character is a promise uh, that it will always be there, that it won't change. You know, if you look at those uh, great cartoons uh, since the beginning of cartooning, um, they lasted for decades, not just years. And so I've always had that in mind, even though I didn't get to become a newspaper cartoonist, I've always had that in mind that I wanted to uh, create something that lasted for uh, uh, quite a while. And speaking of lasting for a while, you have a new book out, Diaper Overload. What can <laughs> someone learn regardless of age from the lessons in this book? Well, when I hear the title read back to me, I it's cringe. funny. I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled <laughs> funny. So, okay. What, what can, I'm sorry, ask the, the last part of the question. What, what, can, can, what can someone learn regardless of age from the lessons captured in the book? Oh gosh. You know, I don't, I think my, my books are mostly lesson free. I think that, um, I'm just hoping that kids can read my books and they, they can see that reading can be joyful. You know, we as adults read for pleasure. We don't read for work, uh, you know, unless it's part of our job. Um, but kids, they're the same way, right? Is that we as adults hand them these books that are pedantic or, you know, that didactic. I'm not sure which word is the right one here. Um, but we we hand them books that are the classics that that we try to get them to read to, to, um, to, to edify them. But kids are going to reach for books that, that entertain and amuse them uh, or interest them. And that's what I'm trying to do with my books. I'm just trying to keep the quality high uh, so that kids uh, reach for another later on. Yeah. And it must be hard pumping out that many books. I know I've, I've interviewed James Patterson and he has a ton of co-authors and it's like, a, I think he has like a dozen writers at this point or so. Yeah. And so it, that that's probably a challenge. And especially because the pressure of, you know, keep the brand going, keep the cartoon going. So I, I think that's very commendable that you've been able to do this and keep this promise. And and I think the mission, just like I remember, you know, years ago, like Harry Potter books, like that got a lot of people to read. And now your books are getting people to read. And, and I think that that's a really good thing in a world where, you know, people are distracted. Maybe they're just looking at the next TikTok or Instagram feed and, yeah. and reading is still valuable, especially... I was always told, and I learned early on, like if you want to be a good writer or communicator, being a good reader is very important. Yeah, it's essential. You can't really become a good author unless you're a good reader first. Absolutely. And what's your best piece of career advice? I would say to really listen to yourself. Um, I, you know, in college, I was a computer science major. I struggled through it, but I always liked criminal justice, you know, and, and what ended up happening is in my last year of college, I switched my major to criminal justice. And I remember thinking, why didn't I do this? Well, like what, what was it that was telling me all of this time that I needed to do, do this one thing, the thing that I really should do when I had this passion elsewhere. And of course now I became a children's author, but but I tell my uh, kid now who's going to the same college that I went to, I said, listen, if you walk by that robotics uh, lab and, and you say, boy, that would be interesting. I'm like, take robotics 101. And I think really listening to yourself, um, you know, uh, about what you're, what you're passionate about, what, you, what could make you happy is really important because a lot of people just chase uh chase papers and they 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 do what they think they should be doing but they if they follow their um you know what they're actually interested in it could lead to a more fulfilling life i call this career experimentation as in yeah. you don't know what it's going to be like to produce a cartoon if you don't try it right yeah. and so i think i like that advice of of like, just take a class. If you don't th like the class, if you don't like 101, you're probably not going to like 102 or 201. Yeah, there's a book uh, called Range, uh, which is which is a great book. I think it's called uh, Why Generalists Thrive in a Specialist World or, or something close to that. And I've read that like three times and it's become our parenting philosophy with our kids trying to, you know, teach them, teach them not to worry too much about sunk costs um, that's something I'm actually really good at in my life is I'm happy to abandon things um, when they aren't working or they don't hold my interest. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that's another thing I'd say as career advice is, is let go of sunk costs because everything you learn, you're going to use in some other form. Um, so no, no lesson is, it sort of goes to waste, but um, you don't want to be stuck somewhere. You don't want to be stuck. Well, that's great advice. And thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you very much. 